Okay, I'm going to start this video off, as I usually do on my Heathkit test equipment videos, with a perusal of the relevant sections in Chuck Pinson's excellent book on Heathkit test equipment products. Now I've already done a video on the IT2250 capacitance meter, which uh, dated from 1981 and was produced through 1987. And I've also done some videos on Heathkit's earlier digital uh, VOMs, including the um, IT or IM1202, IM1212, IM1210, and I'm preparing to do one on the slightly later IM2212, but. I thought I was kind of leaving out in the mix the IM2215, which is approximately the same age as the previously mentioned IT2250 capacitance meter, and in basically the same case. And this is a slightly older product. They went through about the same time before they were discontinued, but the meter the uh, digital multimeter, that is, uh, came out a few years earlier. So that was the basic product that defined that case, and then later on they reused the same basic case for the IT2250. So I never had one of these, although I did own a 2250, but I decided I was intrigued by the IM2215 and wanted to include that in my list of uh, videos for vintage heath kit test equipment. I also have a 2260 that I recently purchased on eBay which is on its way so I'll probably do a restoration on that along with the uh, 2212. I was trying to get my hands on the other one in this series either the 2262 which is the LCD version of the 2260 or the 2264 which is basically a 2262 with an extra analog meter on it so you can see trends more easily but both of these have been so far unobtainium on the places I usually look for vintage test equipment so anyway back to the 2215 so it came out in 1979 and was carried through 1986 cost just under a hundred dollars at that time or during that period. It was Heath's first handheld digital multimeter. And of course they did have other models that came later but this was their first. It features a three and a half digit LCD display and push button selection of function and range. It measures plus and minus 1000 volts DC and 750 volts AC maximums. It has over voltage protection of 1000 volts DC and 750 volts AC on all AC and DC ranges. It measures AC and DC current to plus and minus uh, 2 amps or 2000 milliamps. It has overcurrent protection at 2 amps in all circuits associated with the uh, current range. The input impedance is 10 mega ohms on all ranges, which is pretty good and in line with modern equipment of this type. It measures resistance to 20 mega ohms with selectable high and low voltage test. It has an optional leather holster and it runs off of one 9 volt battery. One subtle feature of this meter is that when measuring resistances in the ohms mode, there are two different measurement voltages available and it depends on which resistance range is selected. Half of them have a higher measurement voltage and half of them have a lower measurement voltage. If you're planning on doing resistance checks in a circuit, in other words measuring the resistance of a resistor that's in a circuit, it's better to have a lower measurement voltage
so that the uh, silicone junctions, whether in diodes or transistors, is not forward biased with sufficient voltage and therefore the uh, you won't have the sneak paths through the semiconductors that'll throw your measurements off. Otherwise you probably prefer to have a higher measurement voltage. Again it's sort of a sneaky feature it doesn't call it out on the front panel of the meter. It's just something you have to know about that um, it's pretty much every other range has a high low uh, alternating measurement voltage and uh, I'll mention that in a little more detail later on. Okay here's the meter in its leather carrying case holster and inside we have the meter in one compartment and the included test leads in the other compartment. I won't take the test leads out right now, but that's what the holster looks like. It is designed to be a handheld unit operated by a single hand. It's sort of optimized for right-handed people. You're supposed to be able to mash these buttons with the uh, fingers of the hand. Personally, I must have short fingers or something because I find it's a little awkward. Although you can sort of do it, it's just a little awkward. You can, of course, do it with the other hand, mashing buttons with your thumb. And this is indeed the way I would probably use this. So here's a bit of an overview of the front panel. It has a common jack, which is used for all measurements. Then the primary jack is for voltage and resistance measurements. If you're measuring amps or milliamps, you use this other jack. So either the test leads go here and here for voltage and resistance, or they go here and here for current measurements. It does say what the maximum current is, maximum 2 amps between here and here. It is fuse protected and 500 volts from here to ground. Um, and then between common and here it's 1000 volts DC or 750 volts AC, maximum voltage. We can select between the milliamp volt range and the ohms range by using this button which stays in. So the combination of which position this switch is set in and where you have the leads hooked up makes the difference as to what you're actually measuring. So let's say you have the leads here and here. This button needs to be out in the color-coded uh, peach colored or whatever that is, pink color uh, for milliamps. And then if you want to measure uh, voltage, you leave this button out, as the picture shows, and connect your leads up to here. Once again, the blue color code. And then if you want to measure resistance, you've got your leads here and here. You go with the green color code, and now you have to push in this button, and it stays and it's an alternate action button. Then you've got the ranges all the way up through here. There are six choices and they're all radio buttons so pushing one of those six will release which other one was already pushed in. The bottom range is only used for the 200 millivolt range and the 200 ohm range. Then the next four ranges are used for 2, 20, 200, and 2000 respectively. Although in the case of milliamps it's uh, 2 milliamps, 20 milliamps, 200 milliamps, and 2000 milliamps or 2 amps. 
in the case of voltage, you already had the 200 millivolts down here, so now you have a 2 volt, 20, 200, and that's where it stops. So that may actually be a usable range. I would have to check the circuit. And then on the right column, we already discussed the low 200 ohm range, and then we have a 2K range, a 20K range, a 200K range, a 2000K or 2 meg range, and then a 20 meg range, which is the only thing using this top button. Now I said just before that there's nothing on the front panel saying which positions in the resistance range will forward bias silicone junk or silicon junctions and in fact it does I was mistaken about that the ones with the diode symbol are the ones that will forward bias silicon junctions because the measurement voltage is higher on those ranges if you do not want to forward bias those junctions you use the 200 the 20k or the 2000k slash 2 meg ranges and then finally the top switch selects between DC and AC measurements the ohms range is only valid in uh, DC so to measure ohms you have to have the switch out and it says that here reminds you and then you can measure DC milliamps or amps and DC volts with the switch out. You can measure AC milliamps or amps and AC volts with the switch pushed in. And all that does is it engages the internal precision rectifier circuit which is also called an AC converter circuit. Then up here we have, and I'll mention that there's the on off switch on the side. Now as for the display, it is an LCD or liquid crystal display and when I turn it on I have a nice reading of zero with a negative sign and the negative in this case just means it's overranged or it's an invalid input. There's nothing connected to the inputs at this point. Uh, because I'm in the uh, 20 range and the meter itself can go up to a reading that's in line with a three and a half digit meter the maximum count or the maximum reading is 1999 and what's not shown here is the one digit that would appear right here it can only be nothing or it can be one when it's nothing it's just a blank display in that position then um, you've got the other three digits that's the three digits and then the one that could be here is considered the other half a digit in the three and a half digit display so again you could have a maximum reading of 1999 on here which is just a hair less than two so whenever for example we have the 20 range selected what that means is the largest reading you can have here is 19.99 or just a hair less than 20 if I go up to the 200 range it moves the decimal point and now I could have 199.9 as the maximum reading and so on so the decimal point shifts as I change the ranges there is also a low battery indicator up here in the upper left which only turns on when the 9 volt battery that powers this is getting down below about seven and a half volts the meter cannot work well I think the threshold is about 7.2 volts if the battery gets lower than that the meter will start acting a little squirrely at the very least the readings will be off less accurate in other words uh, as long as the battery voltage is higher than about 7.2 7.5 volts then the meter will meet its um, its specifications for uh, operational functionality and accuracy the back of the meter has a flip out kickstand which holds it up 
for easy reading when it's on a bench. If you're using it in handheld mode, then this just snaps down and you use it in handheld mode. Turn the power back off. And by the way, I was lucky to find one of these. This was an eBay purchase. I, I never owned one of these originally to have one already. So this was something I purchased. They, there were several for sale at the time I went looking. And this was by far the cleanest one. It didn't have anybody's name scratched in it. And from the pictures in the sale listing, it did not have any, any of the bleed on the LC that you sometimes see where there's intrusions of black bleeding in from the edges. It's a very clean display. Uh, finally, over here on the side is a uh, jack for a power supply. It needs to be a... Uh, it doesn't have to be regulated strictly, but it needs to be a filtered uh, DC supply capable of suitable uh, current to match the battery at least and uh, I think it could be a 12 volt supply or something. It's not exactly um, critical what it is um, but there is a recommendation for what type of supply voltage you would have for an external supply. And it looks kind of funny but that's really a quarter or an eighth of an inch um, tip ring sleeve or tip ring connector otherwise known as a eighth inch or 3.5 millimeter phone plug that's the type nowadays we always use barrel connectors for power but at the time this came out those were not as popular and they were certainly not standardized but what was standardized was the eighth inch phone plug for for many power applications Actually, I think I misspoke about that. Um, there's also a smaller size than eighth inch. I forget exactly what the dimension is, but that may be what this one takes. I tried putting in an eighth inch uh, phone plug and it would not go in, so I think it's the smaller size. And it's although it's larger than what it appears to be here, that's really like a rubber grommet with a hole in it that covers up the actual jack. Uh, it makes a little better seal, helps keep dirt and so on out of the internal circuitry. Uh, now with that grommet in there, the area that would normally be exposed around the outside of the jack and the case is sealed up. So only the hole into the actual jack is visible and any crud or dirt that might go in there will only go into the jack and not go all over inside the case. So here's the internal view with the circuit board removed. It's all on one circuit board except for that small one on which the LCD display is mounted. And there's not really any circuitry on that, other it's just a, a connector board. So a lot of space is taken up with the switches and most of the connections are on the circuit board but there are a few done with wires on the top. You've got your input connections, various discrete components, uh, there's a custom I think, probably a resistor network and then a big shunt resistor that's probably for the current mode some trim pots there's a probably an op amp IC I don't have the schematic for this yet but that's probably a digital chip but I'll find out later when I get the schematic and down in there you can kinda of see it just next to the uh, ribbon cable there, the shiny large IC in there, that's a inner sill. Is it the 7107, 7106? One of those, one of them's for an LCD, one's for an LED. This is obviously for the LCD one. 
and that's really the all-in-one uh, digital meter chip and the rest of the circuitry here would be to condition all the different types of inputs so that it ends up with the requisite input voltage to that one big IC in there. There we get another view of the the big chip in there. Some support components under the display. Some of them for the the big chip but some for other things just spilling over. I suspect that op amp there is the one that's used in the AC to DC converter or the precision rectifier circuit that's probably used only for the AC ranges. And my guess would be that the vast majority of this circuit is switches and resistors. There is a transistor down there. Um, you're going to need at least one transistor probably for a constant current source for the ohms mode. That would be my guess. There are a few in there. I have tested this meter and it's in pretty good calibration. The biggest problem it has is that these switches haven't been used for a long time and they don't make very good contact a lot of the time. And it seems that these are um, break before make possibly type switches. So if you move the switch and it doesn't make good contact in the new position it's not still making contact in the old position and the input floats. There is some capacitance on the input uh, or at least internally in the signal path and what I found was that if I switched from one range that was working to another range the input would just sort of freeze or the display would just sort of freeze and it would not respond to any input changes. Um, it was just like it was doing a sample and hold of the latest value that it got before I moved the switch and I suppose that would work due to the high impedance of the uh, the meter chip if it's given no input then some capacitance in the circuit might tend to hold the last value for quite a while uh, until it's overridden by a, a new valid signal and that I could only get by you know just mis uh, manipulating kind of doing this type of thing wiping the contacts and then all of a sudden it would start working so uh, these are sealed switches I cannot spray any deoxid in there um, so this meter is not likely to be a, a good user not that I would because I have many better meters but even if I wanted to use it it might only recover through use just enough exercising these switches that they eventually clean themselves adequately This is one cute thing that I haven't seen elsewhere that to make the fuse for the input I'm not sure if this is a current range fuse or an everything all ranges fuse but um, it may be just you know in the common lead or something I'll have to trace it out or look at the schematic but there's certainly a fuse here which is mounted on the 9 volt battery connector so that they both come out of the case at the same time that makes it easier to check more accessible for replacement so here is the bottom of the case with the insulator slash shield wrapped around. The shield only gets connected to the circuit one point and that's over here where the screw goes through and that goes into this uh, aluminum spacer which goes to the circuit board and I'm sure we'll find out yeah that looks like a kind of a star pattern coming off of there. So I've slipped the circuit board back into the bottom of the case. 
and the trick there is that there's a separate piece of plastic you can see it underneath the buttons of the switches and that slips into a slot in this area and you have to finesse that in there because it sits on top of the circuit board but you have to get the circuit board in so the switch can slide in and also that um, bushing there sticking up through the board and it's quite a tricky fit took a lot of goofing around before that finally slipped back in there Another tricky thing is getting these wires back in there so they don't get pinched by the case. Okay, the insulator and shield is back down and screwed in. And then the front of the case just slips down on top. Make sure it's not pinching anywhere. Looks like it'll all close. Because of the intermittent operation of the switches on this meter, I thought it would be more frustrating and time consuming to shoot a continuous video with narration while I was futzing with the switches to get a good uh, reading. So instead, I just took still photos of each reading and now I'm going to present them as a narrated slideshow. I'm going to start by doing several resistance measurements just to demonstrate the functionality and uh, accuracy of the meter. And I should point out I have not recalibrated this meter. It seemed pretty close, so I have not actually recalibrated it. When I turn the meter on in ohms mode with the leads disconnected, I get an infinity measurement which on this display on this meter just reads as a one and nothing else. I'm using my vintage Heathkit IN3117 decade resistance box for these resistance tests and my first setting is to 40 ohms and the meter shows spot on 40 ohms. Next I set up 162 ohms and the meter is reading 161.5, so not too bad. Next, a setting of 1,000 ohms or 1 kilo ohm, and the meter shows 1,004 ohms. A setting of 1,350 ohms gives me a reading of 1,354 ohms. A setting of 172,000 or 172 kilo ohms gives me a meter reading of 171.8 K. Switching to the measurement of DC volts, I have the meter hooked up to my power supply. And the first setting is 2 volts, which gives me a reading of 2.04 on the meter. Then 4 volt setting gives me 4.09. A 16 volt setting gives me 16.47. A 20 volt setting gives me 20.09. A 24 volt setting gives me 24.7. And finally, the top that my power supply can put out, 32 volts, gives me 32.9. Next, for measuring AC volts, I'm just using my Variac, and this isn't precise. Um, off camera, I did compare the Heathkit meter readings with a modern fluke meter, and they're pretty close. The discrepancies seen here have more to do with the inaccuracy of the Variac's meter. I'm starting out with a setting of about 50 volts, and the meter shows me 51.3 volts then a setting of approximately 100 volts gives me a meter rating of 
And finally, a Variac setting of 120 volts gives me a meter reading of 124.1 volts. To check the current functionality of the meter, I used one of my own design 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter testers, and uh, that's in a current loop with a 24 volt power supply just using my bench power supply, and then the uh, Heathkit meter in series with that, so 24 volt power supply, 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter, and then the meter. And uh, initially I did not have another meter in series. I just turned the tester down to its minimum setting, which is slightly below 4 milliamps, and the Heathkit meter showed a reading of 3.88. That's probably not too far off of the actual value, because I have this tester calibrated to be able to go slightly below 4 milliamps and slightly above 20 milliamps. Then I go for the mid-range on the tester, which should be about 12 milliamps, and the meter shows me a reading of 12.23. Then I move the uh, knob uh, nearly all the way up, and I'm getting a reading of 19.90. All these tests are with the meter in its 20 milliamp range. Then I switched to the 200 milliamp range. Then I introduced another digital meter, not shown in the photos in series with the loop so I could double check the Heathkit meters readings and uh, then I adjusted the knob on the tester to full clockwise which gives me a uh, 20.5 milliamp reading on my bench meter again not shown here and the Heathkit meter showed 20.6 I should also mention that in order to see a reading higher than one nine point something milliamps on the three and a half digit meter I had to switch to the 200 milliamp range so I could see the two in the left most position then with the other meter still in series I went down and dialed in 12 milliamps read on the other meter and the Heathkit meter showed 12.0 so spot on and then I went down to the minimum reading or near minimum reading and using the other meter I set it right in at 4.0 milliamps and the heath kit was also showing 4.0. And I should point out that I left the heath kit meter in the 200 milliamp range as I went back down through the uh, 20 to 4 uh, span. So it probably would show, it, w it would show an additional digit of resolution on the Heathkit meter, but that's trimmed off here because I'm in the 200 milliamp range. So that might have showed a bit more discrepancy between the two meters, but it would still be very close. Now with the basic meter functionality verified, I'm going to move on to my usual in-depth uh, description of the schematic diagram and therefore the circuit theory behind the operation of this meter. Okay, I'm going to go through the uh, circuit and the schematic in some detail, as I usually do on these videos. And to keep it a little simpler, I've reproduced the schematic several times, and I'm going to discuss one copy of it at a time. Each one is marked up for different aspects of the circuit, so we don't get overwhelmed. This first copy is for the power circuit and the U4 support. U4 is the ICL 7106. That's the intercell part number for the original 7106. Now intercell is long out of business and different companies have made these chips. They're still made today. They're just a building block boilerplate kind of IC for implementing a three and a half digit uh, meter using a fixed input voltage range.
and they handle everything from uh, references to differential inputs to scaling circuits to dual slope um, analog to digital conversion uh, formatting of the output for the type of display display driving all of that stuff is inside this one chip so these are widely used and Heathkit did use the ICL 7106 so first off the 7106 is set up to use both positive and negative voltages it has various circuits inside of it to control that but one thing that's important for this circuit is we have a 9 volt power source with a power switch there's a protection diode it's a Zener diode of 12 volts it should never turn on unless you connect something here that's more than 12 volts now looking at the actual schematic here's the 9 volt battery its minus side goes to VSS and there's the negative side of the 12 volt protection Zener diode so that's the minus side of the battery I guess I should probably mark plus and minus on there it wouldn't hurt plus and minus there we go so the minus side of the battery is connected to VSS as shown here and then the plus side of the battery normally goes through the uh, AC adapter jack and if the adapter is not plugged in then it just continues through the jack it goes through the power switch and it becomes VDD and of course it goes to the plus side or the cathode side of the Zener diode protection so that's what's shown here I left off the schematic for the jack I just come out of the 9 volt battery go through the power switch here's the cathode side of the 12 volt Zener and then we have VDD so that gets you a nice 9 volts from here to here but what's this plus 2.8 and minus 6.2 stuff? Well, the VDD is applied to the V plus pin of the 7106. And the VSS is applied to the minus or V minus input of the 7106. Internally, within the 7106 is a precision uh, power supply circuit or a voltage reference circuit more accurately it doesn't supply power so much as it uh, is a voltage reference it effectively positions the common terminal of the 7106 at 2.8 volts lower than the V plus terminal and again I should probably mark that in there for clarity so this whole thing is the 7106 and this is V plus and this is V minus and this is COM so to recap that uh, internal voltage reference in the 7106 positions the COM terminal at 2.8 volts lower than the V plus terminal meaning that the uh, in reference to ground these voltages here are in reference to ground or the common of the 7106 and therefore VDD is plus 2.8 relative to common and VSS is minus 6.2 relative to common you add up 6.2 and 2.8 and you get the 9 volts that's applied so that's essentially how we get a plus and minus or bipolar power supply in the meter circuit without having any power supply components we're utilizing that sort of obscure internal feature of the 7106 to effectively get a bipolar power supply from a 9 volt battery or if you plug in the external AC adapter then that disconnects the battery 
and provides its own 9 volts in place of the battery and everything else is the same. So that's the power aspect of the circuit. Now let's look at support, um, support circuitry. There is an internal integrator for the dual slope analog to digital converter and this capacitor and this resistor are part of that. There's also an auto zeroing capacitor, part of the auto zero circuit. Won't get into how that works, that's really an internal feature of the 7106, but that's what these two capacitors and one resistor are for. Then there's a reference capacitor which is basically in the reference uh, circuit as a stability device. Again, we don't have to worry about that too much. Then we have an internal oscillator. This does have uh, an oscillator internal to it and it uses this capacitor and this resistor connected to these three oscillator pins. So again, there's internal circuitry that uses all these components. Now I haven't highlighted it here, but the ICL7106 uses dual differential amplifiers internally to it. So you have a differential input that the positive side is called input high and the minus side is called input low. So that's a differential input there. Then there's also a reference high and a reference low on these two pins. So what it's doing is it's taking the voltage between ref high and ref low and comparing it to the voltage between in high and in low and it takes the ratio of those two voltages, multiplies them by 1000 and that's what it tries to display on the digital readout. So it's always looking at a ratio of the reference and input voltages. That'll come into play and be important later on when we discuss certain other parts of this circuit. But before I move on, the uh, input high, the ref low, the ref high, all get conditioned by external circuitry, but the input low is always tied to circuit common and to the common pin of the 7106. So it's always referenced to this point here. So this next copy of the schematic I've got marked up for volts. And it also includes the basic reference voltage circuit that is used in different ways. And you can hear in the background, probably, my village is testing its uh, tornado siren. <laughs> um, anyway, there is a companion part to the 7106, and that's the ICL8069. And annoyingly, and Heathkit did this a lot, they failed to identify the part in their literature. They'll say things like, oh, it's part of something else, but they don't say that it's an ICL8069. It's kind of annoying. But that's what it is. It could be anything, but it's essentially a 1.23 volt, and I think I can pull it up here, after Intercell quit making the part, Maxim made it, and now Maxim has discontinued it, but there are other makers that make it, or equivalent parts. Um, and let's see, let's see if my camera will focus on it. Essentially you just have a higher voltage, you use a uh, limiting resistor and then this part and it's schematically shown like a Zener diode but it's much more complicated than that. Uh, and then you can put a potentiometer across it and tap off some other voltage. You should put a uh, filtering or a stability capacitor across it as well. 
and it is recommended as the reference input to a 7106 although let's see it shows a 7107 here it's another chip in the same family works the same way uh, and basically let's see it's a 1.2 volt temperature compensated voltage reference so even with other changes in the circuit due to temperature this is always going to put out 1.2 volts and it does come in different packages you can get it in an 8 pin package where it's only using two of the pins or you can get it in a round metal can transistor like package or a uh, plastic uh, TO92 style which is what um, this kit uses it uses one or the other of these two I think the normally supplied one has the TO 52 packaging. But anyway, coming back to this, so we have our VDD up here, which, as I already mentioned, is 2.8 volts. You've got your limiting resistor, you've got the 8069 giving you 1.2 volts, you have, you've got your uh, stability capacitor across it, and then you've got um, a potentiometer and some other resistors across it which is for the DC calibration. Um, you essentially then pick off a ratio of this 1.2 volts with this resistor divider and then you can use it uh, elsewhere in the circuit. Or you can tap off of the full uh, 1.2 volts through this resistor and either use it down here or reference it back to the ref high input of the 7106. So that's what's going on there. Now let's look at when we're in voltage mode where's the ref low. So we already have this point here the positive side of the voltage reference going to ref high and the negative side taking a ratio of it, coming back here, and going to the ref low. So essentially we're impressing that 1.2 volts across the ref high and ref low, but because of this voltage divider, the voltage difference between ref high and ref low will be less than 1.2 volts. And that is adjusted by the DC calibration trim potentiometer. That handles all DC uh, calibration functions uh, in the meter with that one pot because of how it's manipulating the voltage on the reference input of the 7106. Now let's look at the the bulk of voltage measurements. So we come in with the uh, V slash ohm, in other words the voltage input jack the voltage comes up here through this resistor up here and it passes through this precision resistor voltage divider network this is a, a monolithic package it's a hybrid circuit and it includes one two three four five resistors in the package from 9 megs 9000 K 90 K 9000 ohms and 900 ohms then we go through, this is actually a non-functional switch, they just did that for convenience of the circuit board uh, just to get a trace through probably where there was no room. There was an unused switch gang there so they just tied all the pins together and they just go through. You can pretend like this doesn't exist. Then assuming we're in voltage mode with the volt, milliamps and ohm switch, the voltage divider continues down and now we have discrete components remember we left off with 900 ohms here now we have a 90 ohm a 9 ohm and then another precision monolithic hybrid uh, resistor network for a 0.9 ohm and a 0.1 ohm resistor finally returning to circuit ground and returning to the common jack so essentially what we've got here 
is whatever input voltage we're connecting here and here is impressed across this great big voltage divider which ends up being quite a high impedance if you add up all these other values from 0.1 ohms all the way up to here to 9 meg you have a 10 meg resistance between these jacks or across these jacks that's why this meters rated as having a 1 mega ohm input impedance that is always there regardless of what else you do in the circuit. Now let's pretend that we have the 20 volt scale set so all these switches here are the range switches and they are shown as if they're in the 200 millivolt DC position in other words the lowest position so I've marked this gang of the switch as being an exception when we're in the 20 uh, volt range this switch will be closed from here to here instead of here to here so essentially what we're doing is we're tapping off the voltage divider here going through the switch and by the way at that point there's also a capacitor that branches across some of the resistors that's just for a little additional stability we feed back through these other contacts then we come up here and again this is a ratio of the overall voltage tapping off of the voltage divider so now we go through the um, volt milliamp ohms switch again and then through the AC DC switch since we're presuming at the moment that we're in DC volts our tapped off voltage continues through here goes through another gang of the AC DC switch and then we have a filter that's comprised of this 1k resistor and this capacitor 0.047 microfarads two circuit ground so that's just a traditional RC filter that uh, takes any higher frequencies and shunts them to ground so we are trying to look at DC here because we're in DC volts mode so it's shunting any AC component out to ground and leaving only either very slow uh, changing um, DC or actual non-changing st uh, stable or static DC voltages we run through this coupling capacitor and we go into the input high uh, pin of the 7106 now we already know that the input low is cut, tied to circuit ground which is the same thing as the negative lead of the test leads and the bottom of this resistor divider so once again all we do is we take whatever is applied to the input jacks run it through this big voltage divider tap off of it give it a little bit of a low pass filter and then run it into the uh, input high and the input low is at the other side of the potential of the uh, big input divider and as I already mentioned then we the chip the 7106 compares that voltage to the something less than 1.2 volts coming from here because of the DC Cal control and it takes the ratio metric difference of the input voltage and the reference voltage multiplies that ratio by 1000 and that is what it tries to display up here so that's how DC voltage is measured okay now I've got another copy of the schematic marked up for how amps are measured or milliamps we have a very similar arrangement here the uh, again we're presuming it's DC we're talking about here you've got the DC Cal uh, trim pot is taking a portion of the 1.2 reference voltage and impressing it on the reference high and low inputs of the 7106 so in that sense it's just like with measuring the voltage now we are not using this jack anymore because 
there's a separate jack for milliamps or amps. We're not using this jack anymore, therefore we are not connected up to the top of this big voltage divider. It's not in the picture in its normal capacity anyway. But what we are doing is using the bottom part of the voltage divider, meaning the uh, 9 ohm resistor, the 0.9 ohm, and the 0.1 ohm resistor, these two being in the precision uh, hybrid resistor network. And let's see what we have. We come in, we pass a current through the milliamp jack, through the protection fuse. It's limited to 2 amps, which is the maximum. It's actually 1.999 amps that it can measure. We come up here, and now let's say that we're in the two or 20 milliamp range. So this switch here is closed in that range, and all the others are as shown. So that current goes up here through these two switches, and now it comes through here. If we were in the 2 milliamp range, then it would continue up and come down this way. But because we're in the 20 milliamp range, it comes here and passes through the 9 ohm resistor, through the 0.9 ohm resistor, and through the 0.1 resistor, and returns to circuit common, and also returns out the common jack and continues on its way. So the current is basically doing this. Because the current is flowing through this low value resistor, Let's see what it is. It's going to be 10 ohms, right? 0.1 plus 0.9, that's 1 ohm, plus 9 ohms, you've got a 10 ohm shunt. And that develops a voltage between circuit common and wherever the current came into the divider, which is here. So we've got some voltage developed from here to circuit common. And that voltage is proportional to the current coming through the jacks. So we tap off of the voltage divider and we go up through this part, but it doesn't really matter what these resistors are because everything downstream from here is such a high resistance that any resistances here look like nothing. It's essentially a direct uh, connection. It feeds back through here, through the uh, volts milliamp position of the switch, through this do-nothing switch, and it passes through the 90K, 9000 ohm, and 900 ohm portions of the upper resistor network, but again, those are as nothing compared to the downstream impedance, so you can just think of these as being a direct wire going through here. And this switch here, switch 5, is the same switch as down here that we're using to pick the 20 milliamp range. Up here it's called 20 volt, but it is physically the same switch. So when this one is engaged, this one is engaged down here. So we break out of this circuit here and we take the same path we saw before measuring DC volts. We come through here, come through here. Once again we have the uh, low pass filter, RC low pass filter, and we apply to the voltage to the input high. Remembering that the input low is tied to circuit common. So once again, we have developed a voltage by dropping a current through a shunt resistor. And then it, we're measuring through this whole network, we're measuring the voltage dropped across the shunt in the input high and input low parts of the 7106, which is comparing that again to the constant voltage from the voltage reference taking the ratio of the two voltages, multiplying by a thousand internally, and trying to display that up on the display. So now I've already shown how DC volts and DC milliamps are measured, so it's time to talk about how is it done when it's AC. Well, everything I already described is exactly the same. The difference is when we get up to here, we're coming out of this network now because this switch is in the AC position as is this one now instead of just routing the signal around 
the AC-DC converter. We go through the AC-DC converter and then everything after that's exactly the same as it was for uh, DC volts or DC amps. So this is the actual signal path. We have a capacitor and a resistor and those feed into this protection network here a diode clamp to VDD which is positive 2.8 volts or a diode clamp to VSS which is minus 6.2 uh, 6 volts uh, it doesn't matter the way this op amp here is powered because we're not using anywhere near that maximum voltage range. We're only working in a couple of volts above or below the common voltage of zero volts. So the fact that it has a power supply of only plus 2.8 and minus 6.2 doesn't enter into it as long as we don't exceed a couple of volts above or below the zero reference point. Then we have another coupling capacitor. These coupling capacitors are here to reject any DC component because again we're in AC mode now we don't want to be looking at any DC voltage or DC component of an AC voltage instead we're looking at only the AC part so this this capacitor and this capacitor strip out any DC component and now we have to reference the result of this to circuit common and that's what this resistor here does it goes back to circuit common and therefore it establishes that as a zero uh, reference at least in terms of uh, the DC aspect of the circuit. Now you may notice that this is a 1000 mega ohm resistor. You think, wow, I've never seen a resistor that big before. But that's what's here and it seems like it's an incredibly large value, but then you have to remember that the input impedance of an op amp is way higher than that. It's practically infinite. So by comparison, this is still a rather low resistance value. So it's useful for establishing a, a ground reference or a, a circuit common reference at this point without itself uh, being significant in comparison to the input impedance of the op amp. As far as op amps concerned, this guy isn't even there. Now we've got a capacitor going around here, and we've got another capacitor here, we've got a resistor, we've got diodes, more resistors, resistor capacitor, a trim pot, all sorts of junk, another capacitor. What's this thing doing? Well I had a bit of an interesting time with this. I redrew it several times trying to understand how it worked. I am familiar with a number of different um, precision rectifier circuits and I was also reading the circuit description in the Heathkit manual which didn't do the greatest job of describing how this circuit worked. And I realized that this circuit here is very close if you strip out all the puffery around it it's very close to being a classic precision rectifier circuit, full wave precision rectifier circuit, I should clarify. And let me digress for a moment. So why do we need a precision rectifier anyhow? Well, if we're trying to convert AC to DC, you might say, well, the simplest way is just to take your input signal, run it through a diode, and you've got your output signal. This is AC, this is DC. It's a half wave rectification because it's only taking into account when the input is positive and therefore the diode is forward biased. But, and this may seem insignificant if you've got fairly high voltages. For example, in a power supply, the say 0.7 volts or thereabouts forward drop of the uh, diode is insignificant. If you're running 20, 30, 40 volts, for example, you can ignore that and it's just not really part of what you're worried about. But when you're working with small signals, that can really mess things up. For one thing, 
this voltage here needs to get up to the positive forward bias of this diode, you know, a substantial fraction of a volt before it will even start conducting. So let's say it's 0.7 volts. Now you've got an input signal that's working between, say, 0 volts and 0.7 volts. You'll get nothing on the output because it's not enough to forward bias the diode. Once you start getting above it, all of a sudden you start getting an output. But now, let's say you've got 0.8 volts out here. You lose 0.7 volts in the diode, and now you've only got 0.1 volts out here. Well, that's a substantial difference from 0.8 volts when you're only working in, for example, a, a 2 volt range, which is pretty typical for meters. So the precision rectifier comes in using an op amp. This is a classic inverting uh, buffer op amp. So the positive input's tied to ground or circuit common. You've got your input, you run through a, say, a 10K resistor into the minus input or the inverting input of the op amp. Then you have a feedback resistor that's, for example, the same value, another 10K resistor. This is going to have a gain of 1. And, but wait, there's this diode stuck in here. So, remember that a characteristic of the op amp in this configuration is that it's going to adjust its output until it gets both inputs to be the same voltage. So let's say you put your uh, 0.8 volt input here. It's going to try to drive the output here until it gets 0.8 volts back here. Now, in reality, this is going to look like zero volts, but this is also tied to ground here, so this is also zero volts. It's looking for zero volts. Let's say that you, uh, the op amp is going to try to drive its output. It sees this as being um, a, uh, a current going into the input, again, hypothetically speaking there should be really no current going in because it's a practically infinite resistance but just bear with me uh, it can detect that you're trying to uh, drive the input and it drives the output until it has the same thing coming back here as was going here so it's essentially stripping out the diode forward drop it always boosts its output enough that the diode drop is canceled out until you get stasis in the op amp. I maybe didn't describe that in the best possible way, but because the diode is inside the feedback loop of the op amp, its forward voltage drop is overridden by the op amp, and the op amp will stop correcting once you have the same thing here as here. So if you had 0.8 volts here, you're going to get 0.8 volts here. This is going to be 0.8 volts plus the 0.7 volts. It's going to be higher here, but this is not where we're looking at the signal. We're looking at it out here. Now, because this is inversion, it's really the other way around. Minus 0.8 volts would give you a plus 8 volts out here. But um, Now we could rework this to be a non-inverting op amp we just move some of the parts around a little bit but that's the essence of a precision rectifier now I've redrawn this circuit here and left off the front end protection stuff and some other things just trying to get a better picture of what's going on here so now we're in the non-inverting configuration of the op amp we have a, a capacitor and a resistor once again stripping out any DC component, um, essentially any DC component cannot get through, and then we have this high value 1000 meg uh, reference resistor establishing this point here at zero volts. Uh, now if we drive the input positive, we're on the plus side of the AC waveform, uh, we go through this capacitor which should look like 
it's a short circuit when we have AC, just like this one looked like a short circuit with AC. And now we've got a positive output, so it's going to go through this diode. This is the one that's going to conduct. This diode and this resistor are like they're not even there because this diode is reverse biased. So now you come through here, and now what you have is a voltage divider being fed. You got this resistor and then this resistor. This here really acts just like one resistor. This is the AC calibration trim pot. It's a small value compared to this resistor. You can think of both of these as being just one variable resistor that could be anywhere between uh, uh, 3K and 35 uh, or 3.5K rather. It can be anywhere in that range. So, you know, roughly half of this. So we're sort of cutting the voltage coming through here in half and taking that and we filter it with a very small value capacitor. That's just for stability. And we feed that back. Once again, this capacitor is going to look like a short circuit because it's still uh, something that's moving in an alternating fashion. And then that couples back to the minus input. So it's an awful lot like what we would normally have in a non-inverting op-amp circuit. Uh, the op-amp is going to try to drive its output until it gets the same thing between its positive and minus inputs. And to do that, it has to make its output 0.7 volts, or whatever the forward voltage drop of this diode is, plus the fact that we're cutting this in half so let's say we come out of here with um, 1.7 volts, right? So we strip out the 0.7 here, and then we take the resulting 1 volt and cut it in half. We have half a volt, and that's fed back around here. So it's going to adjust its output until that makes sense, and we have the same voltage here and here. Then when the waveform goes negative, it's going to try to drive the output negative. The same thing happens, but now this guy looks like he's not there because this diode is reverse biased. And now this diode conducts. And it's the same thing. We still have the 6.8K resistor. We still have the 3K whatever cow pot. We still have this uh, stabilization capacitor. We still feed back through here. And it does the same exact thing but in the negative uh, direction. Now, that doesn't do us a lot of good, except that we know that we have now successfully rectified this, um, except that the input is still going positive and negative. We're allowing it to because of the configuration of these diodes. But we're tapping off of this point, going through an RC filter, and then going out. Uh, the way this particular, there is ways of setting up precision rectifiers such that you're actually using both the positive and negative half. This is not well explained in the Heathkit documentation, but I think what's happening here is that for purposes of our measurement, we don't even care about the negative part of it. Uh, what we're doing is we're tapping off when it's conducting through this way fairly high value resistor and a capacitor and then going out to the meter, the 7106. Uh, this is doing nothing here when it's conducting in the negative part of the circuit. But every time we're in the positive part, we pump some current out of here into this capacitor and then it's measured. So. I think what's happening is that this capacitor is holding the value here during the negative part of the waveform and then it's getting topped off, recharged, refreshed on the positive part of the waveform and that's what we're measuring. Um, there was something mentioned in the Heathkit circuit description saying that the way this works out it compensates, it's compensated for somewhat by the fact that we're doing this voltage division here so that uh, uh, 
the average value on here is a little bit saggy it's a little bit below but that can be compensated for by how you adjust the AC cal here so that you essentially get the correct output here in DC corresponding to the AC value up here so I probably used enough time on this but that's essentially what's going on hopefully I haven't put my foot in my mouth anywhere in relation to that I only spent about 15-20 minutes analyzing the circuit so I hope I didn't miss anything important okay for resistance measurements once again I have another copy of the schematic I've marked it up to highlight the pertinent parts of the circuit now if you've seen my other videos on various digital meters produced by Heathkit they all had one thing in common and that is that they measured the resistance by passing a regulated or a constant current through the resistor and thereby measured the voltage drop across the resistor and just measured it like a voltage and had it scaled such that uh, the voltage drop by the resistor would be proportional to the uh, the resistance in such a way that it would make sense when you displayed it on the meter. This guy works a little differently. It uses one of the other techniques for um, for measuring the resistance. It does not have a constant current source. So instead of measuring resistance the way I just described, this circuit uses a ratio metric approach. What it does is it takes a fixed voltage, it doesn't matter what that voltage is, and passes it through two resistors in series. One resistor is a fixed or reference resistance, and the other one is the resistance that you're trying to measure. And then it takes the difference it measures the voltage across the reference resistor and compares it to the voltage measured across the resistor under test takes the ratio of the two hence the ratio metric part I mentioned earlier ratio metric just means measuring the ratio um, so it's comparing two different voltages measured differently and to make that a little uh, clearer hopefully I've redrawn it so let's say we have a voltage reference. This is a fixed voltage. It does not change. And then we have our reference or resistance standard. I'm calling it RS. And it's in series with RX, which is the resistance that we're measuring, or the resistor under test. And then there's a little fixed resistor in here. It doesn't really matter. Um, we pass this we apply this fixed voltage from here to here and therefore a current flows it's the same current through RS and through RX therefore a voltage will be developed across this according to simple Ohm's law which is proportional to this resistance and then under the same exact conditions the same current going through both resistors we can measure the voltage across here which is proportional to this resistance but we don't know what the current is nor do we care all we know is that both the reference resistor and the resistor under test have the same current going therefore the the voltages taken across them when you take the ratio of those they will be playing on an even playing field so we have voltage ref developed here and voltage input here these are applied directly to the 7106 remember that we have the reference high and low on the 7106 and we have the input high and low on the 7106 and that the 7106 takes the ratio of the reference voltage and the input voltage divides that or multiplies that ratio by a thousand and that's the number it displays so let's take a little closer look at this circuit here we already have the negative terminal and I should probably there I've marked the terminals where the I did it in the wrong place ah. ignore that the terminals are here 
This is the COM terminal down here. And this is the ohms terminal up here. So these are where the test leads are and this is where the uh, resistance being measured is. The common terminal is already tied to input low and we can't avoid that because that's the way the 7106 is wired up. Input low is always tied to circuit common. Then we tap off the other side of RX. We have a little bit of a filter here, a resistor and a capacitor. And that just rejects anything out here that may be changing fast enough for this capacitor to be shunting. Normally it wouldn't do anything. We just measure that voltage off as V in. Meanwhile, we are measuring across the reference, high and reference low, from the reference resistor. And we have a little bit of a protection on there. There's a uh, temperature dependent resistor and a Zener diode and a series resistor and that is all part of measuring this resistance here. So now let's go back to the actual schematic. We have this reference up here but we're not using it the way we did for for AC DC volts or AC DC current but it is still there. Here however we're not using the ratio of this 1.2 voltage reference through the DC cal part that's not being used at all. This switch makes sure that this part of the circuit is even, isn't even connected up here. Instead what we're doing is we're taking the high side of the 1.2 reference coming through this resistor R9 and passing it here to the ref high and then the ref low is instead being tied, or remember that the the uh, negative side of this guy is at circuit common, but because we're measuring across a reference resistor, the other side of this cannot be, the ref low in other words, cannot be at circuit common. Instead, this circuit that I illustrated here is played out up here. It's really the same thing, it just looks different because of the arrangement of the components. This here, this point here, is the same as down here. This 1K resistor is this 1K resistor. Here's the temperature dependent resistor that's here. So this point here is this point here. And that is where we're tapping off the reference low as shown here. So that's what we do. We come over here, go through this switch, which is only closed in the ohms mode or the ohms position. We have this weird looking upside down bipolar transistor. When it's connected this way with its base tied to its collector, it behaves like a Zener diode. And that's why I showed it here as a Zener diode and then we bring that over and that becomes the ref low the low end of the reference voltage we don't know what it is at this point it depends on the uh, current going through the series resistors but again it's not important it's the ratio that matters not the actual voltages meanwhile we have our reference or not our reference but our resistor under test, our RX, it's connected to the common lead which is going to circuit common and then the other side goes through the V slash ohm jack and that is connected just like this to the other side of this 1K resistor that's here and we're tapping off of it with a RC network so we come up here, we go over, here is some resistance, we go through the uh, ohms position of this switch, the ohms or resistance measurements have to be done with the ACDC switch, I let my camera drop, <laughs> the ohms or resistance measurements have to be done with the meters ACDC switch in the DC position, we don't want 
this guy playing a part, the AC-DC converter in other words. So we just pass through here, we bypass that, we come here, we have the resistance and capacitance filter, that's this here, and then we come straight into the input high. So again, all of this here is essentially just this. This is just drawn without all the uh, fluby dust surrounding it. It's all stripped out and just shows you the core part of it. So, um, once again, the 7106 compares the voltages measured across the reference resistance and across the resistor under test, takes that ratio, multiplies it by a thousand, displays the result on the display. And that is how resistance is measured on this meter. I now need to go through how the meter handles its actual LCD display. This is a function that's built into the 7106 on the 7107 version of this IC which is intended to drive LEDs this part is simpler but we're looking at the LCD version the 7106 so this is pertinent to this discussion it's necessary to drive the LCD with alternating current you can't just stick a potential on it it won't work properly all these segments on the display and there's all these different segments making up the characters in addition to the decimal points the minus sign and the low battery indicator all of those are considered to be segments and the way they are built physically is you have this liquid crystal which I've shown with a layer of dash or slash lines and you've got multiple segments which are just conductive plates now these are actually made so thin that light passes right through them. It's just molecules thick, but that's all it needs. So these are essentially transparent conductive segment plates, and they can be in any shape or size, and there's one of them for each thing that's uh, filled in black here. And then on the back is the so-called back plane, which is another transparent conductive layer that goes behind the whole thing. And whenever you apply an alternating polarity signal between a segment and the back plane, then it changes the polarization on the liquid crystal in that area and changes it from transparent to opaque. So that's the way we get the character segments to disappear or appear. It all depends on the phase. If you drive these in phase with each other, then it's essentially DC. And the, uh, the segment will not appear. But if you drive them alternating, then they, uh, then they will appear. So to recap that part, um, in order for the segments to appear, they have to have the signal here and the signal here opposed to each other. If the signals are in phase, in other words, both energized at the same time or both de-energized at the same time, then the segment will not appear. But if they're opposite, this higher than this one or vice versa, then that segment will appear visually. So here's a little bit of a waveform. Uh, the way the 7106 generates this, it utilizes a signal that is in line with the VDD voltage, which is 2.8 volts. You may remember in the power supply section I mentioned how uh, VDD was held at 2.8 volts relative to circuit common by the internal voltage reference. So let's just say that the positive output is VDD or 2.8 volts and then the test will be some negative voltage and it's typically minus 2.2 volts. That's the voltage coming out of the test circuit here. 
and is also consistent with the signals coming out of all the 7106's segment driver pins. Each of these goes to a different segment on the display. They're not multiplexed in the sense that an LED seven segment display would be. All the segments are driven simultaneously. There's a, a wire for each one. So uh, the LCD backplane is going up, down, up, down, up, down between 2.8 volts and minus 2.2 volts. Meanwhile, the LCD segments, if we want them to appear, are just the complement of that. When the backplane is on, the segment is off, or again, not off, it's just at the opposite state. And that means that all the segments would appear. But if you shifted this 180 degrees so that this was on when this was on, or vice versa, or both were low at the same time, then the segment would not appear visually. So that's the way that the 7106 drives the LCD. It takes care of all that internally. You don't really have to worry about it. But it does not know about decimal points. It can detect when it's a negative voltage and it will also turn on the minus sign. But what about the decimal points? It doesn't know about all this range selection stuff out here that we've already talked about. So that's where this extra circuit has to come into play. Here is the range switch. The uh, I've got these marked for resistance but they could be uh, any of the other ranges. So the 20 meg range, 2000K, 200K, 20K, 2K, and 200 ohm ranges. And these four middle ones are the ones that are used otherwise. So this is a 2 volt range, a 20 volt range, 200 ohm, or 200 volt range, 2000 volt range, but you can only go up to 1000 volts. And the same thing with amps. Um, uh, except in that case you can go up to 2 amps. So the range switch has all these separate gangs here. They're all mechanically tied into the ones that do the switching up here, but these are additional gangs and they're used to control the decimal points. They're all tied to a common line which is VDD or 2.8 volts. Meanwhile, the VSS line remembering that VSS is minus 6.2 volts so we have our 9 volts from the battery applied between here and here. So this logic gate instead of being powered for example from 0 to 5 volts it's powered from negative 2.2 volts to 2.8 volts which is 5 volts by the way. So it's in a happy place it's just that where it thinks ground is, is actually minus 2.2 volts. And that's in line with what the 7106 is trying to do. Um, there are these pull down resistors here, which are pulling down this input, this input, and this input, pulling it down to the, the test voltage or minus 2.2 volts. So I'm going to stop here and look at how the XOR function works just as a bit of a reminder or a primer. I've made a truth table over here but before I talk about that let's revisit how this set of XOR gates are connected. One input of each XOR gate they're all tied together and that goes up to the 7106's backplane signal. I've already talked about how the backplane is always modulating uh, between 2.8 volts and minus 2.2 volts. So it's sort of an AC signal. But again, the minus 2.2 volts that the backplane is using as one of its extremes is the same 2.2 volt that's used as the minus power supply and therefore the common reference of all these gates. So we could think about that as being this is just modulating between zero volts and something else and then this is zero volts within this small frame of reference so you can think about it that way.
Then the other input, which I've shown in blue, those are the ones that are connected to other things here, and those are the ones that need to be pulled to logic low when they're not being pulled high by these switches. Uh, these three are really easy to figure out because you've got a resistor to logic low pulling it down and then you've got a switch or switches that can sometimes pull it to logic high or 2.8 volts. So now knowing that those can work that way, oops I skipped a skip. Um, this particular one, these three all work the same way with the pull down resistors but this one doesn't have its own pull down resistor exactly but what it does have is you have this upside down NPN transistor which if we just pretend like it's not there at the moment you have a path here to the collector and then through this 470k resistor by the way these are all 470k's too how about that and it has to have some way of getting to uh, to a negative potential and I was trying to figure out how it gets to a negative potential well I thought for a moment it might be trying to get to ground or circuit common by going through the power supply uh, internally and getting pulled that way but no this side of it's tied right to VDD which is 2.8 volts so in this case these three have one pin each or one input each tied to logic zero this one has one pin pulled to logic high instead but at least it's being pulled somewhere so ignore my little squirrely lines here I was trying to figure out how it goes so now to the function of the XOR this is the back plane input that's all these yellow ones and here is the DP or the decimal point input which is these ones in blue although this one isn't technically used as a decimal point but for the sake of the truth table that's what I'm calling it and then we have the output which is these four points the outputs of these logic gates with an XOR if both inputs are logic low the output would be a logic low just like an OR gate would be and if both inputs are logic high or true then that's where the XOR kicks in it turns the output to zero because it's an exclusive OR gate a regular OR gate would treat both inputs on as being an output on but because it's exclusive it says no only one it's this OR that not OR and so both input zero output is zero either input zero and one input on so an off and an on and on and an off results in an output high and then if both inputs are on then we have a zero again just like when they were both zero uh, if you look at the back plane which we know is flipping back and forth between high and low when it's low the output will be the same as the DP input of the gate a 0 to 0 a 1 to 1 but when the back plane flips the other way around now an input of 0 that before got you a 0 now gets you a 1 and a 1 that got you a 1 now gets you a 0 so depending on which way the back plane is currently flipped high or low the output will be either in phase with it or it'll be out of phase it'll be inverse from the back plane so that's the key to driving these decimal points because remember we have to always have for a segment to appear the back plane must be 180 degrees out of phase with the segment and that's what these XOR gates give us since one input is always in line with the back plane signal so um, essentially what happens is this does the logic to figure out which decimal point should be on at a given moment depending on which uh, which range we're selected to on the meter if we're in the 20 meg mode 
or if we're in the 20 mode, then we energize or make logic high this gate. If we're in the 200 or 200 ohm or 200 millivolt range, then this guy is energized. And if we're in the 2 range, then this guy is energized. So that moves the decimal points around because it only allows one of these three to be energized at the same time. And because the other input to these gates is always the back plane, when you energize one of the blue lines selecting one of the decimal points, it, its output here that's actually driving the decimal point segments will be out of phase with the back plane. But when these signals here in blue are logic zero, then the output will be in phase with the back plane and therefore the segments for those decimal points will not appear. So that's how that works. Now for the low battery, that's another segment, but it just says low bat. It's done similarly. It still uses one of the XOR gates. It's still driven by the back plane, but it's not driven off of the switch. There's no switch that says the battery is low. So what we have here instead is this NPN uh, transistor that's connected between, on one side its emitter goes to VSS, which is minus 6.2 volts, and its uh, collector is tied through this resistor to 2.8 volts and meanwhile the base is tied to minus 2.2 volts because that's what the test output has on it. What that all amounts to is this, is, this transistor is set up as a comparator and it's always looking at the voltage from here to here or from here being high to here, 2.8 volts to minus 6.2 volts, it's looking for, instead of that full 9 volts, it's looking for 7.2 volts as the threshold. When this drops to the point where it's uh, less than 7.2 volts between here and here, this transistor starts conducting and now it's pulling the, uh, the input to this XOR gate in the opposite direction. Before, remember that this input was tied through this resistor to VDD, that's 2.8 volts. But when the transistor starts conducting, which happens again when the battery voltage gets below 7.2 volts, now we're pulling this point low and it's being pulled up to VS or pulled down to VSS which is minus 6.2 volts. So that is how we activate this input of this fourth XOR gate and thereby control whether or not the output here is in phase or out of phase with the back plane and therefore whether the low bat indicator or low bat segment I should say is visible or not visible. So that's how the low bat is done. It's not a function of the 7106, it's a function of this uh, voltage detector, comparator, transistor circuit, and this remaining XOR gate. There's a part of this circuit that I deliberately skipped over or ignored when I was talking about the Ohm's functionality, and that is the subject of what voltage is actually applied to the uh, resistor network here between the standards or reference resistor and the resistor under test. Remember we have this voltage reference that's causing an equal current to flow through both resistors. And I'd said before it doesn't matter what that voltage is as long as it's forcing the same current through both resistors. So here's a nuance of this meter. Um, here is where the positive side of the reference voltage comes out. It goes through 
this low value resistor goes through the switch here and like I would mentioned before it's applied to the top of this uh, two resistor series connection. But there is this transistor hanging out here that we didn't talk about before and it's going to circuit common. And it has a 270 ohm resistor in series with it. And it is driven by the 20K switch and the 2000K or 2 mega ohm switch so that if either of those ranges are selected it conducts over here and turns this NPN transistor on which now provides this 270 ohm load down to here. It acts like a a shunt or a voltage divider and essentially what we're doing here is it's dropping the voltage at this point it forms this into a resistor network or a voltage divider so you've got your reference 1.2 volts up here it's going through a 1k resistor and then a 270 ohm resistor to circuit common so you get you know roughly a little bit more than a, uh, a quarter of the voltage or actually uh, well this is roughly a quarter of this so you're dropping that uh, proportionally therefore this point here which is this point at the top of the resistor circuit drops to a lower voltage and the way that works out with these resistor values is normally you have enough voltage here that if you have any uh, semiconductor junctions in a circuit and you're measuring a resistance here that's in a circuit instead of just a resistor you're holding in your hand but one that's in a circuit uh, there's enough voltage potentially here as a result of this higher reference voltage to actually forward bias some of those silicon junctions silicon junctions I keep saying silicone, I don't know why. Um, and therefore you could get weird results. You wouldn't be measuring the actual resistance because now you're bringing all sorts of other things into it by way of forward biasing those, those junctions. If you're measuring in an in-circuit situation and you want to avoid turning on any uh, solid state junctions in the circuit, you have to make sure that your available voltage is below the typical 0.6.7 volt forward bias voltage of those silicon junctions. And the way that's done is on some ranges you engage this transistor and you drop the voltage. So now this drops to a point where the amount available across the RX terminals is insufficient to forward bias anything. And that amounts to like every other range. The 20 meg range does not do it. The 2 meg range does. The 200 K range does not do it. The 20 K range does. The 2 K range does not. But what about the 200 ohm range? This is another nuance. There is no switch from the 200 ohm range turning this transistor on. But in the 200 ohm range, it the meter does work with a lower uh, voltage applied to the resistors and in this instance it's just doing it because these resistors I've circled here this 1k resistor this 1k temperature dependent resistor and this 1k resistor here they're all in the circuit and they're all a low enough resistance that with everything else being in here taking into account the uh, the reference resistor and everything else you just intrinsically have a lower voltage uh, the rest of this kind of loads that circuit down and you get enough voltage drops in these resistors here to effectively have a lower voltage out here without having to take action with this 
transistor to shunt some of it away. So every other range has a lower measurement voltage for the resistances and then the remaining ranges have a higher voltage. That was something I mentioned early on in this video and that is how that is accomplished. So the only thing I have left to discuss is calibration standards and circuit protection. I've already talked somewhat about circuit protection in the course of the other uh, sections of the circuit description, but I'll go over them again. We have this 12 volt Zener diode here on the power supply, making sure if we have a really high voltage applied, more than 12 volts, that it gets limited 12 volts by this Zener diode. And the only time you're going to have that is if you connect an external power supply to the jack and it's not the one that Heathkit recommends, which is a 9-volt output, same as the 9-volt battery. Uh, maybe you plugged in some other model of power supply. So now the battery is disconnected, and you apply 9 volts between here, or you apply something higher than 12 volts between here and here. Um, then that Zener diode kicks in and limits it to 12 volts and it can work, the, the 7106 can work, everything else in here can work with a power supply up to 12 volts, although 9 volts is the nominal. Uh, everything else will adjust or compensate or work just fine with 12 volt supply. The Anytime you have a Zener diode dropping a voltage, you need to have something to limit the current someplace to drop the remaining voltage Let's say you had uh, 16 volts applied up here. Well, this is 12 volts. Where do you get rid of the remaining 4 volts? And that's what this resistor here does. It's in series with the negative side, but only when we're bringing in power through the jack, not when we're bringing it in from the battery. So if the Zener kicks in, the remaining voltage is dropped across this 47 ohm resistor. That's what that's there for. So that takes care of that. We have these. Uh, we have this NPN transistor up here connected with its base to its collector that makes it act like a Zener diode. That is protection for this part of the circuit. We have a similar thing up here. Two of them, but they're facing opposite directions. This ends up like effectively two back-to-back -back Zener diodes facing in opposite directions. So if one of them breaks down and conducts in the reverse direction, then it will flow to common in the forward direction through this one. If the AC is too high on the other side, then it would conduct the other way. Of course, there shouldn't be any AC here because it should either be DC or it should be uh, AC that's been turned into DC by the AC to DC converter. But what if you didn't have the AC DC switch connected properly or switched properly and you actually applied an AC input but the switch was in the DC position? So you could get negative voltages here. And this not only limits the voltage that's finally applied to the 7106, but it also makes sure that whether it's positive or negative, it's not going to be too much voltage applied to that uh, input high. Now I did say that there should only be DC here, but if you're coming in this way, if coming through this way it should only be a positive AC to DC conversion, but if you're coming through the DC path, because the meter can read positive and negative DC voltages, this point here can be a positive or negative voltage and these uh, two effective Zener diodes again will limit it to no more than a certain amount plus or minus. So that's protection. Going into the AC-DC converter we have two diodes. This one going up to VDD which is whatever I said it was 2.8 volts and VSS minus 6.2 volts which is the same as the power supply to the op amp. All we're doing is trying to keep it so this voltage here cannot be higher or lower 
than the voltage supply rails of the op amp and that prevents damage and uh, when we're measuring current we have the fuse down here and then we have these two diodes that are not back to back they're side by side inverse parallel back to common now remember in the section on current measurement I said that you're essentially dropping um, a voltage across these resistors here which are shunts and you develop a voltage across that um, that voltage is not higher than the forward voltage of these diodes so if you did connect something that was uh, too high these diodes would shunt it and prevent excessive voltage from being developed in here uh, I think that's all the protection circuitry there is in this meter. So now let's touch base briefly on how you can calibrate this meter using no other test equipment. All of the Heathkit meters were set up in such a way that they were self-calibrating, or they weren't self-calibrating exactly, but they contained all the provisions internally to allow you to calibrate them using only those provisions and not requiring some external test equipment. So for calibrating DC signals we just tap off this voltage reference here that we have. We know it's 1.2 volts is very tightly held. I think technically it's 1.23 volts but it's basically 1.2 volts and that comes out to a test point so at various points in the calibration you'll connect a test lead to the V ohm position or terminal and run it over to test point one and then you'll adjust the DC cal so that you uh, get the requisite reading and therefore you know it's been calibrated against this voltage reference now there's an AC calibration standard. Where do we get the AC from? We're trying to exercise this circuit and here is the AC calibration trim potentiometer. What are we basing it against? Well, we happen to know that we have this backplane driver which is running off of the internal power supply of the 7106 and that if we remember, see if I can find it again, the backplane signal goes up to VDD, which is 2.8 volts. So essentially we have a known 2.8 volt signal here, uh, and we half wave rectify it, and then pass it through a voltage divider, two resistors and a trim potentiometer. And this is set initially using it in a DC mode and then an AC mode and once this is set then you essentially have a AC calibration standard which can be measured here. It's a little tricky to describe how that's done but it's a known ratio between what this signal should be just based on what we know about the other voltages and what we know about what this voltage must be and how it reacts so we can take a measurement here and then look at it as a ratio of this voltage reference and thereby adjust this guy and then use this test point to measure and get a signal through the AC DC converter and thereby adjust the AC calibration. I won't go into it further than that, but that's the general drift.